Um, so introductions are often um, funny things. And I'm not promising this is going to be funny, but I'm just saying that uh, I don't want to get too far out in front of Teresa's presentation and Kevin's response. So um, I want to instead talk a little bit about the past and a local past uh, at that. Specifically, um, 1990 on this campus, when uh, Australian cultural studies um, um, theorist, practitioner Megan Morris uh, taught a class, a seminar called Time and Space. Uh, she was here in conjunction with the legendary uh, cultural studies conference that occurred in 19, the spring of 1990. And in fact, she taught the seminar to maybe 30 or 40 people, many of whom were faculty members, such as myself, in the big auditorium uh, in this building. Um, I mention this because in 1990, Morris's seminar engaged a whole spate of work from uh, critical uh, Marxist geography uh, that was being published in those years, David Harvey's The Condition of Postmodernity, Edward Soja's book, uh, and also from literary criticism and cultural criticism, uh, Frederick Jameson's turn toward discussions about uh, space. Significantly, Morris, uh, in her writing, uh, was one of several prominent feminist interventions, including Doreen Massey and Elizabeth Wilson, who pointed out that critical geography, particularly Harvey's condition of postmodernity, traded in a nostalgia by white male Marxist theorists of a certain generation uh, about, the, about why and how space matters in a cultural logic and a media regime of something called late capitalism and something called postmodernity, one of the terms lost in the mist of, of history. I don't want to drift too far into an account of how these writings about space uh, were wound into a discourse about postmodernity, though the latter pertains to a growing effort from critical geography at that time to examine the 20th century's visual image and screen culture. I do want to echo, however, Morris and Doreen Massey's arguments in those years, a period of rethinking the legacy of Marxist accounts of culture and economy that late capitalism and something called globalization had a complicated geography, what Massey referred to as a power geometry, which could not be explained easily by a sweepingly general theory or politics or heuristic. The global occurred, they noted, differently at different intersections in the world. I also want to note these interventions collective albeit not uniform engagement, with the work of Henri Lefebvre, particularly his book, which was published at that time, early 1990s, The Production of Space, translated along with Michel de Certeau's The Practice of Everyday Life uh, at the end of the 1980s. Incidentally, Lefebvre was a speaker on this campus in 1983 in the conference uh, summer-long seminar entitled Marxism and Culture that the unit had a role in organizing. My own forays into the relation between media and space, or media space, were inspired particularly by Lefebvre's book, particularly the clever and compellingly ambiguous way that the book's title summed up the book's argument not only that space is something that was produced, not only by financial, economic, material determinations, but also mm, semiotically by rep representations, by art, uh, etc. But also that space itself was a determining force in history, that space shaped history. And, and it's that lesson that I want to in some ways use as a way of introducing Teresa's uh, presentation today. Media spaces, 
uh, are not only complexly produced, overdetermined in that sense, but they are also productive. And um, I want to uh, ask you to hold that thought while you listen to Teresa's presentation. Focusing on space in a discussion of media or networks or media networks reminds us of the importance of decentering media. That is to say that media is one force, one determination, one element in a spatial production or in the production of space. So it's against this background, this local history, uh, that I'm happy to have Therese as a colleague on this campus uh, because of the interdisciplinary scope and problem of the project of understanding in 2016 the production of space. And I'll just note that if you look around, there are students and faculty from different departments, from urban studies, from the ICR, and other departments that are here today. And of course, the unit has long been a facilitator of these kinds of intersections. Teresa's recent books include the abstract space beneath the media surface, which she published in 2007, uh, a co-edited book entitled Network Practices, also 2007, uh, and more recently, the public space of social media, connected cultures in a network society from 2013. So as is evident from the titles of her projects, she long has been interested in the spatial economies, logics, and discourses surrounding 21st century networks a term that has a long and now vital uptake in my own disciplines of media, communication, and information studies. Her talk today, Network Urbanism, Geographies of Information, if she's not changed it since the last time that uh, I got this title, I say that uh, good-humoredly, uh, focuses particularly on the discourse of the smart city. I have lots of questions for her, uh, having read her paper, but as I mentioned at the outset, I don't want to get too far out in front of her presentation or Kevin's response. So I will join them and you afterward for the conversation. In the meantime, let's welcome Therese Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James, for the introduction. And thank you, Susan and the unit for inviting me here to speak today. Can you hear me in the back? OK, great. Um, uh, first, I feel I should uh, just mention that I'm not a critical theorist. I'm an architect by education and training. But as we all know, that if we're going to try and design future cities, it's going to be an interdisciplinary project. And so I welcome your comments, your criticisms, your suggestions uh, for the discussion afterwards. Let's see. Oops, it's not, oh wait, here we go. All right. All right, here we go. Um, networked urbanism, geographies of information. So most of this talk is um, pulled from my new book that will be out in a few weeks. It's called Intelligent, Intelligent Infrastructure, and it's by the University of Virginia Press. The concept of the city as we know it is undergoing an enormous reformation. As wireless te telecommunication services, locative technologies, and environmental sensor systems converge in physical space. New organizational logics are reshaping the geography and conditions of urban living. Concurrently, confronting climate change urgently demands new policies governing carbon emissions, nuclear power, and the protection of specific natural resources. As urban governance contends with these challenges, the, invest, the incentives to investigate alternative solutions proliferate. Governments and industries must develop not only more efficient energy strategies, but also the means to implement them. New forms of energy production, allocation, and infrastructure, as well as more reliable and equitable systems of resource distribution. 
Although climate change is the most immediate threat, a host of lesser but nevertheless potentially destabilizing problems accompany and intersect with it. Internal and external factors such as migration and population growth materially influence contemporary urban form. In rapidly growing cities such as Los Angeles and Manila, 700 or more new residents arrive every day. While increased density may be, may be seen as a temporary solution to urban growth, some critics cite planning policies themselves as problematic. Formal, rigidly modernist agendas previously established during a time of relative stasis were not designed to respond nimbly to complex, constantly shifting problems. One solution proposed by social geographer Edward Soha suggests that rather than focusing on built forms, architects and engineers should study the connections and infrastructural systems that bind cities together thus creating an advanced framework for improved growth and change. In this way, the discussion of network urbanism can be framed around one key concept, connection, as it relates to the impact of information and communication technologies, ICTs, on urban practices and form. Other topics such as urban sociology, human-computer interaction, network resilience, and renewable energy, while worthy of further study, are discussed here only as subsets of the primary network urbanism framework. So in this section, a theoretical framework for networked urbanism is positioned within a larger conversation relating to smart cities by examining existing limit literature on the technologically augmented city, including mobility issues, resource sharing, and network culture. At this point, I'd uh, like to mention that my particular interest is in network mobility systems, and so you'll, you'll find a, an emphasis on that here. Um, Although the field of urban studies is responding to rapid advancements in ICTs, the literature has not yet fully addressed the impact of wireless impact on reformulating urban space. Significant sociological research has emerged on the topic. However, it has mostly been confined to empirical studies, and consequently, the findings are not aimed at urban design and planning. Examination of sensor-enabled environments exist, but the implications of such environments have not been fully theorized. Further, most previous, most previous research was carried out before the widespread adoption of mobile technologies and the Internet of Things, IoT, defined as the integration of Web 2.0, mobile telephony, and sensing technologies. Other studies analyze transportation and sustainability, but are addressed exclusively to policy makers. Some studies, such as Saskia Sassen's, consider the territorial implications of global economies and free trade zones, while still others address newly developed smart cities, but fail to integrate those within a wider theoretical perspective on everyday existing cities, where most urban dwellers reside. Overall, what is lacking in the literature is an updated and synthesized approach to the subject of networked urbanism in the everyday. So what I'm really trying to say is that within a few years, all cities will be smart. The late William Mitchell, architect, writer, and director of MIT Media Lab, envisioned the modern city as an interconnected network of systems, an intelligent and responsive infrastructure imbued with self-awareness through sensors and computing. And while Mitchell presents a very compelling vision, the subject cannot be studied in isolation, inasmuch as cities are little without citizenry. In this discussion, I intentionally stake out a holistic position by enfolding social practices into intelligent infrastructure. I focus on the ways in which the human dimensions of network infrastructure can be instrumental in shaping everyday practices in urban space. How wireless technologies are being employed to connect transportation, commerce, and architecture. In accordance with Graham and Marvin's notion that cities are socio-technical processes, I will discuss the iterative effect of communication technologies, how social practices are enabled by technology, and how technology in turn enables new social practices. 
with the belief that infrastructural networks have the potential to be integrators of urban spaces, this talk offers an introduction to the critical dynamics and contestations with today's urbanism debate. Intelligent cities are defined by Anthony Townsend as cellular networks and cloud computing tied together the complex choreography of mega regions of tens of millions of people. A quotidian example of intelligent infrastructure is a wireless mobile communication device, the smartphone that connects people, places, and practices within an urban environment. Other types of intelligent platforms cover the spectrum, from network traffic signals that can be adjusted from afar to electric grids that respond to usage to location-aware apps such as Foursquare, which, among other things, combines restaurant reviews with health inspection data. In many cities, from Hong Kong to Zaragoza, a citizen card or city pass, effectively an electronic banking card, offers access to free citywide Wi-Fi network, municipal bike sharing, museum and library privileges, and free public transport. Or in China, where 40% of the population use their wallets, their phones as wallets, to transfer cash, pay for goods or services through WeChat or Alibaba. Or in Sweden, where mobile e-commerce enables a cashless economy. In Paris, Networked resource sharing also includes auto leaps, electric car sharing, and parking system. So vehicles can be reserved via mobile de device or online by credit card, but they can also be unlocked, and they, you can have your parking spaces reserved in advance, as well as many other informal modes, collectively known as mobility on demand systems, MOD, including Lyft, Uber, DD Kawadi, and other similar services are in operation around the globe. Such a system is supported by four components. Number one, software, Internet Protocol version 6, enabling the previously mentioned IoT so that any object can ac be accessed through the Internet. Two, long-range broadband wireless connectivity, what used to be called radio communication. Three, processing transmission hardware, device connectivity via built-in radio communication, and four, sensors or mechanical devices sensitive to environmental conditions that transmit signals to measuring or control instruments. This new experience of technology in the everyday is called intelligent infrastructure. In addition to network programs initiated by private companies or government institutions, intelligent infrastructure also includes participatory practices. In this category, we include civic, civic hacking, crowdsourcing, urban games, the open source, open data movement. Although time does not allow for discussion of the entire topic, it is important to note that individuals and groups create their own platforms specific to their own unique cultures and locales. An example is coders who volunteer hundreds of hours of their time in hackathons, designing and developing open source applications for public use, one of which just finished up this weekend um, at UIUC. Some of these apps, such as Weather, Signal, Rotify, or Waze, are crowdsourced information. Also relevant to the discussion are municipal apps that leverage open public data. For example, the City of San Francisco's Recreation and Park app, or Building Eye, what is being um, constructed in your neighborhood. So if you haven't checked out San Francisco's page, you should. I think it's one of the best um, open data platforms that they have. So other critical applications have been realized for communities under crisis in disaster or emergency situations. Concurrently, many humanitarian groups and NGOs have mobile platforms. For example, the Digital Humanitarian Network, DHN, a group that acts as an interface between volunteer hackers and conventional humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross. The DHN brings together expertise in GIS, online mapping, data analysis, and statistics to assist hundreds of thousands of people enduring crisis situations, finding information, supplying aid, and coordinating disaster and recovery efforts all through their mobile devices. In addition to nonprofit ventures, collective coding groups such as Code for America enlist volunteer developers to partner with contractors, entrepreneurs, and municip municipalities, in some cases leading to the creation of startup companies. So one of the best known, of course, is Ushahidi, um, 
which is a data management system and platform that utilizes SMS texting and provides highly effective um, communication during the typhoon in Haiti and Hurricane Sandy. Ad hoc software platforms developed by volunteers allow citizen users to combine best practices into user-friendly social media toolkits for risk mitigation and community response. These bottom-up efforts by coders and ordinary citizens are some of the more promising aspects of intelligent infrastructure. And at this last conference I went to, I was able to meet um, the digital stewards out of uh, Detroit. They're described as do-it-yourself urbanism or DIY urbanism. And these projects include installation of free neighborhood Wi-Fi, um, as with the digital Detroit stewards, other community toolkits that foster equal access to information through the establishment of mesh networks, ad hoc networks that wirelessly connect computers and devices directly to each other without passing through any centralized organization, such as an ISP. DIY efforts may also overlap with other movements, including internet activism, and some of the best known, of course, our independent media center, IMC, and the Occupy movement. So DIY differs in that although network technologies may be used for organizational purposes, the objective is to promote change directly within the neighborhood. These network efforts are intended to strengthen community and democratic efforts. So network urbanism simultaneously encourages a reassessment of institutional foundations in planning and decision making. In addition to using infrastructure focus sites such as Fix My Street or Fill That Hole, city governments are increasingly embracing network technologies through online interfaces and smartphone applications for involving constituents in land use planning and control. The prevalence and ease of use of these platforms offer citizens opportunities to voice their concerns and provide informational input on land use control through political participation. One advantage is that crowdsourced discussion and decision making may avoid unexpected or unwanted land use changes. Um, Leanne Fennell, uh, a real estate lawyer, says that the point is not to turn over land use authority outright to the public, but rather to find better, better ways to elicit, aggregate, co coordinate, and channel the preferences, intentions, and experiences of future land users. Planners must begin by shifting their focus from the top-down regulation of land use to the development of information platforms for coordinating um, participation. So to summarize, social practices enabled by an intelligent infrastructure known as near-field communication allow wireless communication between such things as phones, transit cords, readers. Those network connections can enable payments through Apple Pay, Octopus Card, or other cards. They can also support data sharing on location information, photos, songs, etc. Such interactions are now common practice in everyday life, where the smartphone has effectively become the urban interface in OECD and Asian countries. In the developing world, where governments are slow or reticent to invest in fixed infrastructure, mobile phones have emerged as the primary method of data communication in place of expensive fixed attendant wireless connection to the internet to access political, consumer, and health information. Mobile telephony has been employed for everyday interactions, banking, making and receiving payments, and even medical consultations. So while the cell phone and the internet have been around for decades, what is new about network urbanism is self-awareness. The smartphone, the most ubiquitous intelligent device, already incorporates sensors such as an accelerometer, compass, and GPS. However, the high cost of these sensors formerly prevented them from being used indiscriminately in the environment. That has changed. The recent affordability of sensors allows their widespread use in machines, devices, and transit, even on individuals such as the Apple Watch. Increasingly, inexpensive wireless sensors will be embedded in the urban environment in existing cities, creating complex large-scale sensor networks. Within those networks, smartphones will effectively act as wireless hubs for other devices, connecting IoT, IoT at the internet. Internet of Everything at the Urban Scale. 
Several cities have already deployed such a prototype system over the past few years, and we have all read in the news about Google's autonomous vehicles with sensors capable of perceiving other automobiles, pedestrians, and road position, in addition to intra-car communication. Whether environmental systems are mobile or fixed, they are examples of infrastructural intelligence, enabling citizens and infrastructure to become hyper-connected to each other and their environment. Okay, so in this section I'd like to step back for just a moment. While the smart cities discussion is a fairly recent phenomena, the interweaving of engineering technologies with the planning and construction of cities dates back to classical antiquity, if not earlier. Within the context of this talk, however, the post-war period of OECD countries is particularly relevant to our concerns. In both the United States and the UK, modernist planning efforts were responding to challenges similar to what we face today, such as managing population density and distribution through new transportation models. Historical examination reveals several experimental propositions expressive, expressive of techno-utopian aspirations, all of which destabilized established modes and methods of urban design. A brief recovery of those earlier proposals points to ways that we can begin to think about smart cities today. During the late 1950s, the rapid rate of technological change characteristic of post-industrial societies called for new methods of organizing space that would facilitate the integrated flow of objects and information. At the 1958 De Los Summit, the Greek architect and planner C.A. Doxiadis launched the field of achistics. It's a complex term signifying settlement within ecological balance. In context with architect Buckminster Fuller and the cultural theorist Marshall McLuhan, they proposed a, quote, invisible extension of the physical, close quote. The intention was to design at the highest possible scale by analyzing vast amounts of global information, what today we would call big data. Without access to computers, but inspired by systems theory, Doxiadis, Fuller, and McLuhan believed that spatial patterns could be detected in patterns emerging from flows of information. Their visionary proposals initiated a form of urban planning dependent upon a grid of networks and special interest communities, all predating the internet. The 1960s marked a parallel movement initiated by spatial theorists, which was mentioned by uh, James Hay uh, earlier on. In particular, the urban planner Melvin Weber's notion of the city as a communication center, the city as a communication system, and the architectural critic Rainer Banham's Autotopia contributed to an increased understanding of the urban condition determined by infrastructural systems. A vigorous discussion emerged out of the College of Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley, where Weber theorized that communication technologies would begin to define an urban realm that is, quote, neither urban settlement nor territory, but heterogeneous groups of people communicating with each other through space, close quote. Moreover, he argued, a city is not described by the buildings, but by the social relations which bind the city together. Indeed, a community is shaped by its social overlay. Thus, the contemporary city can be understood as an information system and conceptualized as a second order abstraction in which the forces behind the form play a role in producing the form. Whereas technological determinists perceive change as originating from modern advances in technology, spatial sp theorists examine the specific economic and geographic forces driving those very same occurrences. Their theoretical frameworks position space as inherently caught up in social relations, thus producing and consuming them. Weber's urban theories were influential not only in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also in the planning of the new town of Milton Keynes in the UK, coincidentally a test location for today's self-driving car. The history of the 1960s also documents an escalating complexity in transportation policy and in de decision-making processes necessary to achieve change. As post-war trends placed an increasing pressure on the historical city, the demographic shift from rural to suburban was producing its own challenges. 
Because new cities arise through contested processes and governance, mid-century town planners had limited ability to realize their schemes. Visionary architects, however, had no such obstacles. I want to discuss a few such examples, both in Europe and in the US, that can contribute to our thinking about Spartan City. This is Jeffrey Jellicoe's future town of Motopia. It embodied a radical, optimized approach to land use planning and infrastructure. It was a public-private venture sponsored by the Pilkington Glass Company and enabled by the British New Towns Act of 1946. Motopia uh, embodied an innovative design concerning the division between pedestrian paths and car roads. For the proposed town of 30,000 inhabitants, roads would be located on the roofs of buildings, as you see here, um, leaving the ground plain a vast pedestrian park. It also included a water, a system of water buses to help residents commute to work. On their return, the residents would have driven to the nearest roundabout that's closest to their house, take an inclined ramp leading to a parking space, and then a lift to their individual household unit. In France, working on the principles of Ville Spatiale, Jonah Friedman spot, thought to provide maximum flexibility through the construction of huge superstructures over existing cities and other locations. The future inhabitants of their experimental horizontal city were free to construct their own dwellings within these megastructures. And in the United States, Disney Realty Company prepared plans for Project X, an experimental prototype community of tomorrow in 1966. Project X was a design community dedicated to advancing industrial research and the development of new ideas. Disney was inspired by the Stanford Industrial Park that was built in 1951 in Palo Alto, California. The university had developed the property to exploit its intellectual and applied research activities in science and technology. Stanford's designers um, combined two things that the, at the time seemed antithetical, industry and parkland, thereby inventing a new hybrid land use. And similar to many day startups, Disney's community was envisioned as an entrepreneurial enterprise. Quote, Project X will take its cue from the new ideas and new technologies that are emerging from the forefront of American industry. It will be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed. It will always be showcasing and testing and demonstrating new materials and new systems, close quote. One peculiarity was that Project X residents were assigned the dual roles of researcher and experimental subject. Each resident was essentially a test guinea pig, trying out various urban and industrial inventions during the course of his or her everyday activities, a relationship that might be difficult to legislate in the present. Disney's conservative politics notwithstanding significant controversies, Certain elements of the scheme seem to resonate today. The residents, offices, and research facilities were structured as a distributed network. The community was auto-free. Transit was by monorail. And the research component was based on a private partnership with Bell Laboratories. Considered from today's perspective, mid-century visions had difficulty surmounting their own conceptual frameworks. According to historian Guy Ortolando, they were simultaneously progressive and conservative. Progressive because they imagined new ways of living, yet conservative because they sought to manage the future along familiar lines. Men still commuted to work, women stayed at home, and planners promised continuity with the past. Ultimately, new technological provisions fail to realign the social relations and collective identity of a post-war population. Experimental cities change technology, but not hegemony. That notwithstanding, the metamorphosis of the technologically augmented urban model in response to different visions, sociocultural expectations, and economic objectives provides a good entry point for understanding the contestations and dynamics that are shaping priorities about technology and urbanism today. 
So moving rapidly forward, uh, I aware that I'm aware that I'm skipping over vast chunks of history. Um, suffice it to say that by the 1970s, a restructuring of the market economy and advances in the field of information technology had created a complex emerging society organized on a diverse cultural base through ready access to information, radio, television, and later the internet. By 2000, Manuel Castell's oft-quoted phrase, the network society, encompassed new forms of spatial and temporal organization, a type of space allowing for distant, synchronous, and real-time interaction. Sasson and Easterling described this societal shift in terms of global flows of information, linking distant locales around shared functions and meanings, reconceptualizing spatial arrangements under transnational economic and trans technological prerogatives. Well, what does this mean for the present, right? To fully realize the network society, substantial investment is required to construct a comprehensive networked system as those proposed by private corporations, Cisco, Siemens, among others, raising larger issues about public and private investment. While private investment has funded infrastructural projects in the past, consider our rail system, it would appear that the government might be in a better position to represent its constituents. Many of those issues remain to be fully interrogated. What is a matter of urgency is the analysis of the effects of ubiquitous computing and network infrastructure has become instrumental for future urban planning and design. On a fundamental level, we must be cognizant that the fragility of an overarching wireless network system, a WNS, coordinating agent systems limits its implementation. Thus, the development of a highly reliable and secure wireless network is crucial to the city's evolutionary development. So I don't know if you were listening to the news on Friday, um, but on NPR, it turns out that um, Dyne experienced a massive distributed attack, cyber attack, um, that they said had emerged from the Internet of Things. Did you hear about that? So, um, and they, Dyne said that had never happened to them before. So um, this is just something new that we should all be aware of. So we haven't worked out all the kinks. Um, other concerns exist that alongside of wireless vulnerability. While the vision of a connected city allows for the expansion of differential pricing structures, it ignores the important issue of equal and universal access. It cannot be overemphasized that a connected city needs to connect everyone. While smartphones are an element of quotidian social practices, they are not equally distributed. And thus, the smartphone is evolving into a form of highly personal infrastructure, which potentially conflicts with previous notions of what is held in common or in public. That shift constitutes, the shift in what constitutes the public is destabilizing historic democratic principles related to civitas and the rights of access to a city. With regard to transit, if microleasing and ride sharing assume computer literacy, will the system continue to serve increased numbers of elderly or underserved populations who are among the highest users of public transit? These are important questions because mobility and access are integral components of the public realm. Along with the push for open data, which is to say data which is freely available for all residents, there exists a concurrent need for software research and development based on actual user needs rather than perceived market-driven objectives. In sum, networked urbanism is an assemblage of diverse human actants, social practices, and computational and physical environments. If organizations, both societal and governmental, are moving in the direction of network infrastructure models characterized by individuality, mobility, and affinity, what might this mean for urbanity? A critical realization is that the topics of sustainability, social equity, public space, urban infrastructure and privacy can no longer be understood in isolation. Each entity is connected to the others through network systems and wireless integration. Okay, so although we have been considering primarily the positive effects of network urbanism, numerous less visible and controversial problems increasingly compromise it. 
policymakers express guarded optimism that ICTs, including large-scale data analysis, can actually bring increased efficiency and order to urban processes. Before we can examine that proposition, we must ask who is behind the Smart Cities Initiative. As documented by Anthony Townsend, the smart city conversation is currently being driven almost exclusively by large IT organizations such as Cisco, IBM, and Siemens, corporations that are motivated to implement their proprietary business models and optimization strategies in economically challenged cities. Other corporations keen to participate in the connected car discussion are well known, Google, Apple, Ford, GM, and others who are attracted to the mass of data collecting opportunities and the lucrative sale of that data to third parties. Cities, however, are not corporations, a point we will revisit later. An important consequence, as most as already are aware, intelligent infrastructure translates into an expansion of network standards of surveillance into our physical lives through WNS, GPS, and other sensor networks. As a result, physical space is being increasingly measured, quantified, and circumscribed by data. What has become a matter of concern is that this future assemblage of WNS and urban space has the capacity to instantiate an extensive applied control topology that entangles sensors with data, personal information, and mapping. In other words, context. The placelessness of the early internet has come full circle, such that every nodal point can be located, interconnected, and known. James Hay has already spoken convincingly on the topic of privacy and surveillance, um, and I do not wish to duplicate his research. However, it's important to emphasize that the, if the entire city effectively becomes a wireless sensor network with data spontaneously generated from each point, then individuals can be geographically located at all times. Located and monitored at all times. Information gleaned from mobilist wireless networks includes whom we come into contact with and for how long, ultimately what value we as individuals offer as a node in the network. The dilemma is that obtaining accurate information is crucial for allowing urban planners uh, to schedule, maintain, and operate a transportation system, as well as to pl uh, plan strategically for future growth and expansion. Nonetheless, the integration of network communication into location-based protocols and the expropriation of that data to external sources, such as mobility providers, raises serious questions about individual privacy. What appears to be an emphasis on mobility customi customization at the user end is actually veiling the commercial practice of personal data mining on the provider end. Users perceive a gain in control, but they are, in fact, being constantly monitored. Quote, the extension, precision, and speed of this data gathering is unprecedented, according to internet theorist Felix Stadler. As our notions of access and mobility are being reconfigured, so too is individual privacy. Okay, so this is one of the light standards that has been installed in San Francisco um, as a prototype system. Um, basically, it has like a cell phone, um, the, the, the equivalent of a smartphone located inside of it. So it has a computer, it has a camera, it has a um, voice recorder, um, it can photograph license plates, um, monitors movement. So I, I would argue that if Paris had had these in 1968, the student protest probably wouldn't have happened. Um, concerns about surveillance of individual and collective actions, including racial profiling, communications and movements by domestic security forces is warranted, both here and abroad. Um, so, of course, here we have um, Chicago's version of it, which has been presented as an art project. Um, but by 2016, there will be 600 of these sensors located all around the city, and they can even pick up your tweets from your phone as you're walking by. As evidenced by WNS, technology has multiple dimensions and may be repurposed for different objectives. Network systems can thereby be instrumentalized for urban to limit urban access as well as to expand it.
hang on, you guys. I have to find the rest of my talk. Oh. Okay. The development of more individualized and flexible forms of engagement within network urbanism may actually counter the connective potentials of the networks themselves. They enable a personalized infrastructure that stands in contrast with public works. While the personal does not always undermine the public, infrastructure as a meta structure is generally understood as universally accessible and thus related to social equity. While most scholars agree that soft infrastructure wireless technologies, the internet, and social media holds potentials to produce new kinds of space and enable new so social practices. Uneven accessibility remains a significant problem. Graham and Marvin's Splintering Urbanism extensively documents uneven economic and technological development related to hard infrastructure, transportation systems, electric grids, and fiber optic networks caused by a pattern of differential access to public services. Looking ahead to the integration of intelligent infrastructure into everyday practices, Antoine Picon presents two contrasting visions. On the one hand, a neo-cybernetic ambition to steer the city in a more efficient way, and on the other, a more participatory approach in which empowered individuals invent new modes of cooperation. Okay, so this was just a month ago, right? So New York distributed these Wi-Fi kiosks all over Manhattan um, so that people could have public access to the internet. Um, and then as soon as the real public started using them, they disabled the browser and, and the tablet that was attached to it. Um, so 20 years ago, EFF founder Mitch Kapoor advocated for an information infrastructure that would be highly open and decentralized, egalitarian and supporting diversity that could create numerous opportunities for civic participation. Yet what has occurred over these last two decades is an increasing colonization of the internet by market forces. Accordingly, technology can contribute to greater social equity if planners adopt a holistic model. A strategic urban design emerges from an overarching vision of what constitutes a thriving neighborhood. Network infrastructure is only one aspect of that vision. Employment opportunities, affordable housing, and enhanced neighborhood culture and identity are others. What unifies this vision is the conviction that social exclusion from access to resources whether information, transit, or otherwise, is best addressed by raising awareness of the functioning of infrastructures and making that knowledge available to others. While many of the ideas set out herein are not fully realized, speculation on the future of cities does more than merely present possibilities. As visionary proposals from the 1960s demonstrated, alternative futures may spark discussion and create new participatory practices. For landscape architect and urban planner Kevin Lynch, cultural imaginaries play a significant role in understanding context and influencing decisions that either enable or limit possible futures. Thus, a discussion of future cities provides a space for urban residents to reflect on their daily experience and, more importantly, to participate in decision-making processes. For decades, planning decisions were based on the incomplete understanding of the consequences of the automobile and the use of fossil fuels, not only with regard to climate change, but also in relation to population growth, suburban development, and industrial expansion. While acknowledging these past shortcomings, we may find that the adoption of network participatory practices may be a productive way to involve all residents in decision-making processes. One aspect of DIY urbanism is that residents can enter into a collective conversation and deliberate on a city as an envisioned space different from what they have inherited. Neighborhood discussions such as these can be one of the most important catalysts for fundamental change. 
Collective intelligence is the capacity of network information and communication technologies to enhance the collective pool of knowledge by expanding the range of human interactions. This is grounded by a historical notion of civitas, which encompasses a particular set of actions, relationships, and powers meant to ensure that all citizens can participate freely and fully in the life of their society. The objective is to look at these new conditions and reflect on how we can meaningfully, meaningfully engage with and change technology, including shaping it towards humanistic objectives. The processes of governance are complex, and ultimately there is no single method nor simple technological solution for collective decision making. How we, as a group, decide to plan for and adopt technology is what ultimately changes governance. Network technologies are restructuring urban practices. This ob observation, however, should not be confused with technological determinism. The integration of network technologies into everyday social practices causes us to reflect deeply on their protocols, platforms, and interfaces. The production of space is increasingly dependent on code, and code is being written to produce space according to Kitchen and Dodge. Um, network infrastructure as a fo form of code is thus actively shaping socio-spatial organizations, processes, and economies, along with discursive and material cultures. Those effects are fig figure to become increasingly pervasive as more and more everyday practices are threaded through network platforms. With that in mind, designers, both urban and software, have a shared responsibility not only to concentrate on problem solving, but also on the unintended social, political, and environmental consequences of their design decisions. While the focus of this project is not on policy making per se, a humanistic approach, one that emphasizes the value and agency of human beings, individually and collectively, places responsibility for the quality of city life on everyone. Design professionals, engineers, policymakers and average citizens alike. The future of network urbanism depends upon conceptualizing infrastructure not as a means of optimization, data collection, or control, but as a collective tissue of social relations binding a city together. Thus it becomes a collective venture, synthesizing public and private, one that must be inclusive and sustainable for the benefit of all urban dwellers. I was not asked to introduce Kevin Hamilton, but I will introduce him, my good friend and colleague. I'm sure you all know him anyway, so Kevin, next time I'll pull this. Thank you for us. Okay, so um, do you want me to put on the other image, too? I'll over there and put that up. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. I've got one image I asked her as to attend. Okay. Do you want the mic? Uh, okay. Do I need the mic? Yeah. For you? All right. To, for pos posterity and records and scribing of all kinds, which we are thinking about here. So um, in the tradition of all interdisciplinary spaces, I'll first say what I am not. Um, I'm neither an urbanist nor an urban studies scholar by any stretch. But like many of you, my ways of understanding how we know the world and how we come to be with one another in it have been heavily shaped by the theories of space and place that James called to our attention at the beginning of the talk here. And my understanding of these epistemologies and socialities is also heavily influenced by histories of the city as a changing form, which we've heard some about here as well. So in those ways, my connections to Therese's illuminating talk are probably much like yours. My avenues into this are through theories of space and place and, and sociality. So and in, its, in this talk's central concern for the role of space and perception and experience of space in subjectivity and citizenship, I think lands Therese's talk squarely in the domain of the unit's tradition, as James helpfully contextualized and I think affirms the central contributions that the unit makes to the university. But importantly, like Therese, I also come at today's subject with one foot in practice and one foot in theory. I come from an art, art and design practice background 
uh, but uh, am engaged with my colleagues in the theoretical and historical and critical dimensions of that. So my remarks here will come not from being uh, firsthand in Therese's field, but in sharing something of, of her um, uh, attempt to sort of bridge practice and theory. Therese has invited us to consider as a type of urban form a historically specific and perhaps new assemblage of technological, networked, and spatial conditions and experiences. Now, some might argue, maybe we will today, about whether or not this form is new within a longer form, longer history of cities, wherein the grid as a cultural form intersected with network communication. I'm always game for decentering technologies as definitions of the new, so maybe we'll, we'll get to that, and James introduced this a bit through a desire to decenter media. But um, whatever genealogies of the set of conditions here that Therese has outlined, I think what remains salient, and I believe somewhat urgent for us, um, is how this talk represents an example of citizen-engaged scholarship in the way that Therese has invited us to understand the inhabitation of particular spaces and socialities in terms of some very historically specific socio-technical systems. The sensors, the software, and the networked hardware of 21st century ICTs, or information and communication technologies. So, in other words, Therese's networked urbanism is not only the result of infusing existing architectural grids with new technical grids, but of the cooperation and commingling of very particular municipal entities and specific corporate ones. So what I infer from Teresa's talk, maybe we can get to this, uh, is that the textbook cases of network urbanism exist, say, in those very specific cases of the cooperation of the city of Chicago with Cisco, Motorola, Intel, and even our own university. So we're not talking about network urbanism as a broad phenomenon of, of possible, possible sense things, but a very specific historical phenomenon of particular entities work to get working together. So as such, I, I, I see, really see Therese as prompting us here in this venue charged largely with theory, criticism, and history uh, to some very important questions and applications, and applying our theory and history to understanding the technologies we carry in our pockets, our backpacks, the technologies that infuse our buildings, our, 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 our cars, and, and, and roads. And thankfully, I think many of you as theorists and historians are engaged in that kind of direct application every day, and there's more and more institutions on campus that are inviting that. I think, was anybody at the cell phone slam that IPRH put on uh, last spring? This is a great example of this, where IPRH, the Institute for Program, um, Illinois Program for Research and Humanities, invited a few folks to just apply their own work to understanding what is a cell phone. Or the Prairie Futures Initiative that Anita Chan uh, is really helping uh, lead so much, so she probably had to leave to do something to it. Uh, we have a number of great efforts going on on campus that are asking us to apply what we're doing together as scholars to understanding of our everyday specific technical platforms. So I take Therese's uh, talk as a good prompt to this. And given the rise of the prospect of a new high profile center for education and design on this campus, the Design Center funded by Siebel Systems, I think applying our distinctive disciplinary theoretical frames and hermeneutics to these everyday infrastructures will only grow more important, urgent, and needed. So I want to take this opportunity to do two things. First, I want to go really broad and invite some other connections that are kind of analogous to the ones that Therese has asked us to make. Uh, and then I'll come back to a more narrow matter at hand and look to briefly just extend or apply her particular argument here a bit. Uh, and I'll just come out and admit that my, my attempt to go broad here is really um, a thinly veiled uh, call for uh, some, some way of, of, of corralling the work that in other places happens around a, a science technology studies program, but which we don't have. And I think a lot of us are trying to figure out where can all this happen in some place that we can give it some visibility. Um, the narrow part of this response is really a much more um, uh, attuned to, to Therese's paper. So first broad, briefly, and then narrow. So, Therese's description of a networked urbanism in which we're to understand the experience of urban space as shaped by an assemblage of physical and digital network conditions and affordances invites for me a number of, of vectors and, and, and unfolding intersecting lines of inquiry. I just, I just want to name a bunch of these that come to my mind. Uh, I'm not going to name the people who are doing them, but I just want to, I want to sort of chart a couple of lines you could take out of this talk, maybe that you already are, and I, th I think I know some of you already are, 
um, just as a way of kind of calling into the room the other ways one could kind of engage in this kind of work. What I'm, what I'm looking at is a kind of uh, application of our theoretical and critical lenses that we come to through the traditions that the unit upholds uh, to understanding the implications of where we live and, and, the, and the technologies we're embedded in. So this is going to be a, a brief litany, just uh, the kind of thing, you, kind of irresponsible thing you can do as a respondent, because I don't have to make an argument about these. I can just sort of name them as, as things would be great to do and some of you are doing. And hopefully one of these will connect somewhat to, to some of your own work and, and, and find some connection here. So a litany, disconnected list. Uh, first, could, could we also usefully describe the networked urban experience as a unique confluence of material flows from the mines where the materials for our batteries and sensors um, through their facilitation of our own movements in these life, product life cycles flow before returning to the spaces of reclamation and waste? Maybe there's another way of describing networked urbanism as a space of material flows of cycles. Second. If by some accounts the spatial grid as a cultural form and practice began as an instrument of settlement with cities adopting that form to reinforce and anchor a wider practices of imperialism, what does this new grid, this new assemblage of bricks and copper and radio reinforce and relate about the current shape of empire? Right? Another thing we could pursue and think about. There's another. The idea of a smart building is, is not a new thing that's been around with us for decades. And yet, it seems that applications in this area have been more present in logistics, shipping, manufacturer, uh, manufacturing, law enforcement, or even incarceration than in shared civic spaces. Um, the buildings that learn are the buildings that ship our products and manufacture our products and that, in, and that uh, encase and incarcerate bodies, I think, more than they are I, don't, I can't call to mind as many buildings that learn that facilitate the kind of civic experience Therese is, um, is, is hoping for. So what could we learn from that fact, from that history, that the buildings that learn, a notion from the 70s or 60s, uh, has found this other manifestation? Um, how, what could we learn from that history and help us in the current, the current design problems that she's set out for us? A few more, and then I'll go back to narrow, narrow again. Um, right now we're in a moment of contested definitions of health and wellness which are really playing out um, not only in our insurance and medical industries, but in the proliferation of these personal health monitoring and fitness devices. And I wonder if the emerging role of networked architecture in that space of health and, and, and smart fitness might allow for some intervention on the behalf of the human form, uh, given that once we start talking about networked buildings and health, we at least can appeal uh, to the life of of blood and flesh in those spaces, where so much of the what I see in um, the sort of current definitions of the data self and service of health and wellness are really not about the body at all. So maybe a slight piece of, of hope there. A couple more. Um, I think Teresa's talk assumes, and I think she really nailed, like really comes to this at the end, um, a, co a conviction long held by many that a city should stand equally available to all as a space to, to build their lives. The addition of networked media to that kind of city, I think, complicates the realization of that goal. Um, in fact, a way I wonder if we might want to talk about, not only by multiplying the dimensions of what is possible in a city and what constitutes urban experience, but when you add the technologies to the city, I wonder if we aren't also writing certain technologies into everyday experience that themselves are responsible for keeping unequal distribution of power in place. Um, and that's a kind of conundrum of this work that I think uh, we'll have to deal with. I think long before we talk about technologies of liberation in the urban context, it seems to me we're going to have to talk also about decolonizing urban inhabitants through unplugging, divestiture, or some form of what Trevor Schultz calls networked, I'm sorry, uh, platform cooperativism. Um, simpler way to put this point, um, a spatial commons that is working overlay with a technology is probably a commons under threat, right? So the technologies bring their own uh, their own politics that we're going to have to somehow deal with in this in this mesh. That might be my most kind of critical point of departure for this. A couple more, and then I'll go back to the narrow narrow in this narrow approach here. Um, you know, if we look at the spatial grid, uh, as talked about by so many theorists, as not only making location possible but presence itself possible. If we look at the grid as even making possible the um, the scribing of absence of people the erasure of people, 
Um, I wonder what might we say now about the presence of these new simultaneous grids. The IPv6 protocol is another kind of grid, making absence and presence uh, possible or, or uh, mediating uh, the scribing of, of vis even mere visibility or even existence for peoples. And I wonder what we could do with and look at with that, that sort of overlay. And just two more points. I, I would say arguably we live now in a moment when machine a machine knowing where we are and what we just purchased at any time is maybe not as even as salient as what software infers about us by analyzing a series of previous locations and a series of previous purchases. So in other words, in the network city, if we look at it as a sensor system for processes uh, that, are, that are analyzing us, those processes maybe even themselves are less and less invested in place and space. Uh, but more as our, our more in invested in our archives of activity about which it infers things about us, and it's really interesting to me to look at that through the lens of cognition and perception. Because um, is it possible to think or conceive of the thinking processes of our networked environments as more or less embedded or embodied in the buildings themselves? The same way we think about that with theories of perception and cognition. We can think uh, some theories of cognition think about the fingertips as mere sensors for a black box of behaviorist uh, analysis of input. Um, is that the kind of smart city we want? Or are we looking at smart cities that um, where there's a more um, sort of embeddedness of thinking and being? And here I think of, I can't, the best example I can think of is science fiction and fantasy. The architecture of China Mieville's uh, uh, planet of Arieka in the book Embassy Town where the architecture is made of living muscle. Um, it's, a, it's a living being where there's actually there's thought going on uh, and sensing. Thought and sensing are embedded uh, in that. And there's some interesting uh, questions here for us to look at there. Tons more places we could go and that you are going. Uh, we might ask um, what cities migrants inhabit in networked urbanism when they're plugged in simultaneously to multiple spaces, home and abroad. Um, we might ask questions about how you plan for urban growth. Many more things. I'm just giving you a bunch of what ifs, but uh, that's really more for the purposes of really trying to underline what I appreciate about your paper here, Therese. I'm not pointing out things I wish you talked about, but more I hear you calling for connection of theory to practice, um, under, you know, applying our critical lenses to understanding the spaces we live, and I'd love to see us do more of that in these kinds of spaces. Um, last thing, just to be more, much more specific and just uh, pose one kind of possible extension and application of Therese's work here, is that um, I think one crucial aspect of the networked urban form you're describing, as I hear it, Therese, is that though a building may remain fixed in space, the experiences of citizens around that building are not, are, are not fixed because somehow of this networked dimension. And I'm not just talking here about the Desertodian subjective paths of walkers, but I feel like you're really asking us to look at, in networked urbanism, a way in which um, the experience of the city is now sort of ontologically dynamic for people in a, in, in a way because of what's changing in front of us. And um, I think this is, this is presenting something that is new from technical and governmental definitions of cities, but not new to most of our social and, and political understandings of cities. And I think that's an interesting moment here. Let me just close with this example of what I mean by this. So um, Therese referred to the work of Kevin Lynch that's probably familiar to some of you. Uh, and Lynch in the 60s and into the 70s was really trying to help understand how do people perceive cities, how do they experience cities, um, so, that you, so that he could design cities that were more available and, and open in the way I hear you appealing to. And the way Lynch was doing that was studying perception and trying to come up with typologies of perception in cities. And he has this famous type, typology that by doing a lot of interviews and studies of how people navigated, he said, you know, we could describe cities as, as composed of, the, of paths, edges, nodes, districts, and landmarks. And that he began to say, if this is a way you could describe people's experience of cities, maybe you, um, by, by designing for high legibility for such things, you could help people navigate cities and, 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 and make them available to themselves. And you know, his hope was that you know, if, if you could design a city to have good pathways, you could design a city to have good nodes, you could design a city to have clearly defined districts and landmarks, and that would help people understand and, and, and make the city legible for them. They could read it, they could navigate it. And really, I, I hear your uh, approach to network urbanism here, Therese, is, is pointing out that at this point, people are not experiencing the same paths, nodes, and landmarks because 
when I ask my phone for directions from one place to another, it's given me a different path than, it's, than it is for you. Um, when, you know, where is a node? A node is, is the, move, the, the roving node, the mobile node, the person is a node. Um, everything that Lynch asked for in terms of legibility of cities is now radically subjectively different for every person in the city in a way that design for legible cities is getting thrown into peril from a Lynchian perspective. But from our perspective, there's no news here <laughs> because uh, I think we could say from social perspective of social and political critique that the, same, the street has not been the same street for any two people um, all along, and this is painfully clear every day, that a single street is not the same for a person of color uh, as it is for a white person at this moment. As, um, there are ways in which perhaps the technical and the governmental definition of cities and space is just kind of catching up to tools we already have been talking about in social and political critique for a long time in terms of talking about exactly how cities are radically different for different people all the time and to, um, to, to quite unjust ends uh, as well as to celebratory and, and, and liberatory ones. So I guess I just thought this would be an interesting um, place to kind of extend your paper in part because, you know, if we do have very technocratic approaches to the city that are just waking up to that radical subjectivity, perhaps that's a place where we can really, in kind of the kind of conversations that go on in the unit, uh, step in with some leadership uh, and influence. So I'll, I'll stop there. I thank you for your paper, Therese. I think you've been holding the technical and the governmental together with cultural and political in ways that our campus sometimes keeps them apart. So I'm really grateful for that and grateful for you making through ways um, for us by coming here and giving this talk as well. So thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, exploit my uh, role as uh, purveyor of, uh, of of questions and um, ask. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Ask uh, Teresa a couple of. Uh, questions. One has to do with the way in which you um, think about in this project differential mobilities and temporalities. Um, I live in Italy over the summertime and um, have met in the last year a couple of uh, urbanists from Milan who talk about the slow city. Uh, Italy is the, the hub of slow food. Um, and thinking that slow cities are, in some ways, the shadow term of the so-called smart city, uh, in the sense that uh, there are different, as Kevin indirectly alluded to, different populations with different accesses, different mobilities, different temporalities uh, in that sense. But the other set of questions has to do with, uh, in some ways, the ways in which the 20th century history that you've charted um, through examples like Disney's Epcot celebration, etc., belong to a longer history of planning uh, and infrastructural development in the so-called liberal city. And um, so to what extent, to follow up on Kevin's point about governmentality or government, uh, might we talk about um, not only a kind of urban planning and policy discourse of smart cities, um, but also the aspiration of a smart city, the smart city ideal as a problem of liberal government in the 21st century that comes out of a modern 19th century history, which um, I'm fans, for instance, of two British historians, Patrick Joyce and Chris Otter, uh, who have talked about the ways in which liberalism uh, became a particular, particularly urban problematic, more than the way that liberalism is frequently ascribed to nations. It became an urban problem in terms of how, in some ways, did one, in some ways, police and manage and govern the city as a space of intense freedoms, right? And how were, following Foucault, 
programs of hygiene, programs of, of gridding, of urban rationality, a way of managing that problem, right, that go back as Otter and Joyce want to point out, the age of enlightenment, the age of illumination had to do with grids of lighting, of, of illumination, of, in a material sense of street lighting that maybe in the 21st century sense are that example of intelligent lighting used as points for creating um, a smart uh, network in the city in San Francisco which you used as one of your illustrations. So it's sort of the question of liberalism and the liberal city, liberal objects, liberal networks, right? I mean, just to bend those terms a little bit uh, as a way, as a lens for thinking about um, problems of so-called neoliberal or 21st century liberal government and then the question of differential mobilities, the, the slow city as the shadow term of the smart city. Well, you asked a lot of questions in there, so um, uh, let me uh, think about a couple of them. Um, so I, I think this issue of different kinds of cities and what is a city um, has existed before, of course. So uh, who, who defines what a city is, right? You know, I think that's the central question. Do the residents of the city decide it? Or does perhaps uh, an urban planner decide that? Or does governance decide that? Um, I don't think it's possible, really, for one group to completely own it. But if I have to throw my hat in with someone, I'm going to say the residents of a city, right? So um, an analogy to, like, the slow city would be uh, uh, in Paris in the late 1940s and early 50s, there was the group of situationists, right? So there was this rationalist planning um, policy that went into implementation where a lot of the artists who were living in the lower income area, um, they were told that that area was going to be raised and they were supposed to move out to the suburbs in these tower blocks and they resisted it. Um, so I used one of the images in my talk, Constance, uh, New Babylon. So I, I think this tendency to want to optimize the city, to want to rationalize the city, um, is like a goal. It's like this uh, holy grail that engineers and city planners have been going after. But often it's a cloak to disguise other sorts of objectives, right? Because people are making money off of the um, rationalized um, implementation. I, I think we have to push back against it because um, is the purpose of life just to be productive? Um, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I have relatives in Italy. Um, so we, I think we have to have a more complex understanding of what human life is and that a city should be a place where we're able to experience the fullness and complexity of life. Um, so along with navigation, I thought this was really interesting because sometimes as planners, how would you design a new city? Like right now, if you had the task to design a new city, how would you do it? How could you ever get the mystery and complexity that an old city has? Like, don't you like getting lost? Sometimes I purposely allow myself to get totally lost. And then I, I use my phone to try and maybe get back to where I need to be. But, you know, I think it's when you are lost is when you open, you're completely open and you look at a city with new eyes. So, um... Yeah, I guess, uh, have I answered your question? What my, my feeling would be is that we need to have a kind of discussion um, that would allow for other ways of being in the city beyond the simple sort of equation of going to work and going home. I, I, I really think that's um, giving you know, hu cities and human beings a big disservice. And, uh, you know, 
the, what I have noticed is that most of the companies that are involved in the smart city discussion, they don't really want public input. So part of my purpose is to, you know, make people more aware of it so that there can be a voice. Other questions? This whole time I've been thinking about the city of San Francisco and its much contested changes over the past 20 years because of the rise of basically Google taking over the town. Um, I have many artist friends who've been pushed out and replaced by programming friends. I have friends who are both artists and programmers and some are going to overlap. But the main thing is um, there was a piece by Rebecca Solnit in the most recent Harper's where she goes into great detail about this, these changes, and of course she's not talking about the technological aspects, but this whole time I've been thinking about um, how, how, this, how, how we're discussing it here, and it seems to be probably one of the most interesting laboratories for what we're talking about, because in terms of a population that would not be served by these changes, or these, these uh, public input from a large part of the population that's being pushed out by high rents and so forth, I mean, I don't really know how to finish my sentence there, but it's... Um, uh, so San Francisco was mentioned, and also Chicago, which is not a place where, I mean, I visit Chicago often, but I don't really see a lot of the implementation that we've been talking about in terms of, as an average person, like an average user. San Francisco, I'm sure there's robust, I haven't been there in 20 years, <laughs> but I'm sure there's a robust um, interaction with people who already would be privileged to use them in the first, uh, these, these sorts of new uh, smart aspects of the city in the first place. So, I, I don't know, I really kind of wanted to hear more about maybe the, the class aspects or the, you know. Well, you pointed out something that, that's very, you know, very clear, happening very, very quickly. It's not just with Google, it's also with the biotech industry right now, too. They're sort of the high priests right now in terms of um, the scientific community. So, um, you know, things like this happen in cities, but it's extreme in San Francisco in San Francisco right now um, and you know that's part of the reason why Google has um, opened a Midwest branch in Chicago so I wouldn't be a bit surprised if San Francisco's only playing out what's going to happen five years from now in Chicago um, so that that's really serious again because it asks the question of what is a city and I, I think if it's, um, is it just there for entertainment, you know? Is that all it, it's, it's at, you know, like, I quote Nirvana at that point. But, you know, is, is a city just there for an elite group um, so that when they leave work, they can go out to an expensive restaurant and then go back? Or is a city a diverse group of people? And I think what we love about cities is that complexity is that diversity, is that unexpectedness. Um, if we always know exactly where we're going, if we always know exactly what's going to happen, if the environment is always controlled, uh, I, I think that we miss part of the pleasure of, of what it means to be alive. Um, so how can we push back on something like that? It, it's very complicated. So uh, you see in San Francisco there are demonstrations. Um, I think also what's happened is the planning department there is diverse and does try and maintain a certain amount of um, conversation between all the residents. And if you look at the planning commission, um, they do represent their individual district neighborhoods. But, um, but on the retail level, so like on commercial property and rentals, you know, it's, it's just a losing battle. It's completely a losing battle. And the way I look at it is that I know I'm getting more into technical facts rather than, than theory, but um, it's meaning people are moving further and further away. And so the commute is getting longer and longer, and people spend five hours commuting. And I just, you know, that's... that's it makes a pretty big carbon footprint, to put it mildly, in addition to you know domestic uh, unhappiness. But um, so, what is it? I think we have to put an economic lens. You know, we we at that point we can start to speak about other kinds of economic systems that might provide a better sort of structure for all human beings to be valued and the products of their work valued as well. We have time for one more question. Any takers? 
to me. Why not? <laughs> um, um, it's more of a comment suggestion rather than a question that I have for you. Uh, yeah, first of all, I thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I learned so much from you. Um, and uh, I think it was either uh, Neil Brenner or Stephen Graham who actually said that uh, what is a city is a uh, less relevant question than now to ask the question of urbanization. So mm -hmm. it's uh, more of a uh, city as a social technical process, uh, like you said. Uh, uh, so, uh, so viewing the city as those entanglements of complex uh, social forces and histories and memories and uh, all these factors are more relevant than uh, just uh, focusing on the technical um, yeah, facts of what the city is uh, in, in that boundary um, thinking about city. And uh, while um, you mentioned that all cities are going to be smart, uh, I have a hunch that uh, all city, smart cities will look differently in different places uh, mm -hmm. according to their different um, social geographical context and their different regulatory frameworks. So um, my uh, research is about uh, yeah, demonstrating that uh, complexity of smart city project in South Korea, uh, where I look at uh, the cultural history of urban development and uh, the authoritarian government, uh, which also uh, puts uh, different like, contexts in regulating those like uh, policies and technology. So in that uh, line of thought, um, I appreciated that you brought up the examples of mid-century uh, prototypes of uh, those techno-utopian cities uh, from uh, mid, uh, was it mid 19th century or 20th century? Um, yeah. And um, and the, the tensions between the neo-cybernetic neo uh, desires to control space while wanting to be like participatory, like inclusive. So uh, these are uh, like tensions that urban planners and architects have been having over the centuries. But um, I think my question is that like, while uh, having learned from these uh, historical um, facts and, uh, and, how, and, and after observing how uh, those experiments have either uh, failed or uh, partially successful, like what uh, the architects and planners in the present, while having learned lessons from those uh, uh, utopian uh, experiments, um, yeah, to what extent uh, can they do things differently? Um, mm. or, yeah, how, how do those lessons inform their practice in the present? Mm, that's a good question. Um, do planners learn from their <laughs> former utopias? <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, I, I I think actually there there are some architects that are pushing the boundaries um, and are trying to create new kinds of space. Um, and the more successful ones are able to do that. So like Cool House and um, Big and other other firms like that. Um, but the part that you raised actually about the unique cultural aspects that each smart city has I, I think is really interesting. So I would actually ask you to comment a little bit about Korea and um, also Sarah is here and she's from Barcelona and Barcelona is considered a smart city, one of the biggest smart cities in Europe. So I don't know if the two of you could comment a little bit about how people perceive it within their own um, within their own culture within their own locale that would be great so Sarah what would you say first and then Shami well um, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit um, precocious I would say about the, the smart <laughs> adjective to the city and I'm more for trying to understand other models. I know that Barcelona has advances, uh, advanced a lot in, in that sense, um, in terms of, you know, severage, organization, uh, having public uh, wireless in almost all the trains, all the, most of public spaces. So we are really advised, uh, you know, like at the front page of this kind of um, uh, improvement for the citizens. But I like more to talk about livable cities mm -hmm. because I think that there are mm -hmm. other aspects that smart cities 
won't, don't cover. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think that, for example, the example of Copenhagen, mm -hmm. it's much more, uh, in Denmark, is much more advanced and more balanced in this human, like looking at uh, human interaction in the, in the efficiency of the network system, no? or the network governance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would say that as far as some years ago, maybe Barcelona was a good model for that, but I think that sincerely, <laughs> uh, Copenhagen has kind of advanced us in that sense, and now it's, it's this other model that looks at this um, network urbanism, but also in this more ecological mm -hmm. and social aspect that you were kind of um, explaining to us today. So. Mm -hmm. Charmaine? I don't know if it's clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, my project is actually uh, a little bit broader than just the smart city, uh, the vision of smart city itself. My project is more of a cultural history project uh, tracing the genealogies of different ideas of city that accompany uh, uh, the smart city vision. So uh, in the case study that I'm working on in Korea, uh, there has been some aspirations to develop uh, that site as a global city. And uh, uh, the smart city actually comes with uh, the moral framework of developing eco-friendly city mm -hmm. um, and also uh, educational city. Um, yeah, so all, all kinds of like this very high tech uh, and um, th these kind of like terminologies are assembled uh, in some of those uh, uh, language and um, what was I going to say? Uh, so about the cultural specificity and yeah, one of the things that I emphasize in my uh, project is that yeah, different culture had different notions of perceiving what uh, smartness is and even even the notion of security and privacy um, and privacy uh, and. Um, the perception of security in Songdo's case is different from uh, what Western audiences uh, perceive in that context. So uh, I uh, used to uh, give a talk about uh, my case study in Songdo in different places. And uh, whenever I show uh, this picture of this control room where they're monitoring all the transportation flow in Songdo, uh, a lot of my American colleagues are terrified by those images, but I actually <laughs> found that picture from the promotional brochure in Songdo, uh, which uh, people there actually feel um, safe, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually uh, go <laughs> and opt for that kind of, uh, yeah, the security that they are guaranteed by moving into that kind of spaces. So, um, yeah, this is a kind of question that I uh, am yeah, I'm interested in exploring uh, what is the kind of like history that uh, formulates the kind of different conceptions of like security or um, yeah, kind of like livability or yeah. efficiency yeah. and yeah. livability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in Spain, I had heard that when um, uh, both policymakers and citizens got together to discuss data privacy, they collectively came up with the decision that the government was best able to handle the security of that data. Whereas I know I don't think that would happen in the United States, do you? You know, <laughs> like so so then again, you know, it 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 does move back into the politics of it. Um, it's a country that for many years tended to understand Michel Foucault only in terms of his writing on the Panopticon as if a deeply libertarian uh -huh. people and country such as this sees as the idea that somehow we're all in prison as uh, cutting <laughs> against uh, what America is supposedly about. But, um, so yeah. I'm sort of agreeing with you. <laughs> The, the idea of governmental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. One last thing, just as a takeaway I get from this conversation is I'm, I'm really struck uh, partly by your question about liberalism, James, and by some of the histories we have and haven't talked about, about how tied the histories of conceptions of smart cities are to the idea of a good life, mm. and yet how much of my attention to the questions of technologies in cities today is not about a good life, but about merely surviving. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and, and how mm-hmm. so many technologies today are uh, that the, the smart that make the smart city thrive and the mobile platform are about people finding work at all. Right? Yeah. Like the, so the, yeah. The crowdsourced uh, labor platforms, mm-hmm. um, the use of surveillance uh, mm-hmm. to try to protect people against police violence, um, mm-hmm. uh, as a as a supposedly sort of key to. Mm-hmm. Surviving uh, as a as a person of color in a in a policed state, and yet that same instrument being uh, part of the cycle of that in certain ways. Like there's, mm-hmm. there seems like there's some really room some room here to talk about the smart city in the context of survival today. Mm-hmm. Like, like mm-hmm. what makes not just good life, but even people able to live, and what are the implications of using these technologies to aid in survival that then then play into the constitution of the cities in these particular forms. That's just something I'm curious to go find some people working on from this conversation. Yeah, and it ties into, to, again, the legibility of a city. Um, how do you read a city? How do you navigate a city? All of that. Um, how, you know, uh, I, I had a friend in San Francisco, so you know the beta breakers, right? So um, he went out with a group of friends, and they all decided to wear costumes. I won't go into detail about what the costumes were. He got separated from his friends, and he didn't. And he didn't have his cell phone. I mean, he was literally unable to do anything. He he he, he because he hadn't memorized any phone numbers. There was no way he could get hold of anybody to come and help him anymore. And um, you know, th- those are just things we don't think about. Um, but how has it really um, become sort of a prosthesis for being able to experience and survive in the city? That's all I'm saying. Okay, I begin the way that I did uh, in introducing Therese uh, because it was a, a long uh, thank you to the unit for criticism and interpretive theory, and particularly Susan for having uh, thought about this topic as one that was uh, that fit within um, the pedigree, let's say, of the, of the unit for criticism and interpretive theory, uh, as much as Therese also began with disclaimers that. She's not a critical theorist, you know, that she's a, a practitioner. I think that um, she's also a catalyst for this kind of conversation, too. So, um, but that said, uh, let join me in a uh, last round of applause for Therese. And she's on campus. You can find her easily enough uh, and continue the conversation. Thanks, Therese. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me.